Hey there, everybody. Good morning. It is Tuesday morning, March 21st, 2023, 11 o'clock in the morning. We're here in Ezekiel chapter number 29 today. So if you're able, turn your Bibles with me to Ezekiel 29. I think there are 21 verses here that we're going to cover today, and we're going to see a shift. Remember, we said there's a seven chapter section pardon me, where the Lord is going to be rebuking some of the uh, secular peoples around Israel as well as Israel. And so for the last three days, we've talked about Tyre and Sidon, mostly Tyre or Tyrus, as Ezekiel called it. And uh, yesterday, the tail end of the chapter, Sidon, that other city there. Now we're going to see four chapters here dealing with the land of Egypt. And uh, we'll pray and talk about what all of this means for them. Uh, Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the ability to come and do this each and every day where we open a chapter of your word and discuss it together. Help us, give us wisdom, please, as we read and study. I pray that you'll help us to learn and grow, have even more understanding of the Bible and and how you uh, dealt with your people and other peoples regarding them. We love you and thank you for your goodness to us. We ask this all in Christ's name today. Amen. All right. Ezekiel 29 would have helped if I had turned my Bible there before we got started. Okay, here we go. Ezekiel 29, verse number one. In the 10th year, in the 10th month, in the 12th day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. So we're given that date marker there, 10th year, 10th month, 12th day of the month. So he was to prophesy then. And when you follow the timeline, you learn that this is done before even the attack on Jerusalem. So if you remember what was going on based on Jeremiah and now Ezekiel here, what we have is the inhabitants of Jerusalem hearing Jeremiah's prophecy, uh, the word getting back from Ezekiel's prophecy. They're a bit fearful and worrisome. And so they turn to Egypt for help. And this is something that Israel has done very often through their history. If you really want to go all the way back to the origin, consider when Abraham uh, felt the famine come to the land of Canaan. And what did he do? He went to Egypt. Uh, He told Sarah, his wife, to lie about their relationship. You go to his son Isaac. When uh, Isaac was in trouble, he went down into Egypt. And so Egypt was the go-to help for the children of Israel in an earthly sense. And the problem is they relied and leaned on Egypt more than they even had faith in God and how he could take care of them, provide for them, and protect them. And so this is why the Lord has a problem with Egypt is because they were in a sense an idol for the nation of Israel. And here is the lesson for you and I, God never wants us to put more faith in something or someone human than we do even him. I tell you, as a pastor through the years, we've had some folks step up and help our church out financially when it was in need, and uh, some of them come through in some really big ways. And it was easy for me, the temptation was there when we would have struggles or troublesome times or great significant needs to think, boy, maybe they'll help again. Maybe they'll show up for us. And uh, the truth is, God wants my trust in him more than I put it in anyone or anything else. And so we know that in the end, God does use people and God can use people to help us But he never wants our faith and trust to be directed at them over him. And so that's the lesson that God's going to teach Israel here because he's going to desolate Egypt. He's going to make them so that they're unable to help Israel in any way. And that'll direct the peoples of Israel's attention back to the Lord. Verse number three, speak and say, thus saith the Lord God. 
Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. So this kind of talk is very reminiscent of Nebuchadnezzar's talk when we read of him in Daniel chapters 3 and 4. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, this is my kingdom that I have built with my hands. And here Pharaoh, king of Egypt, says, I'm in the midst of my river that is my own and I have made for myself. So let's look at this verse here. It contains a lot of good thoughts. Uh, I am against the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You don't want to be the person God is against. You don't want to be the one that God says, okay, I need an enemy and this guy is my enemy. Uh, he is the one that is against me. Therefore, I am against him. Pharaoh is not in a good place. You do not want to find yourself in opposition to God. The Bible says that when we love the world, we are at enmity with God, or we are the enemy of God. Uh, he also says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God in Hebrews there. So, my river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Of course, the Nile River is the river that runs through the land of Egypt, and it is the river that supplies sustenance and, and uh, oh, come on, these big words throwing me here today, irrigation, how about that, for the desert land of Egypt. And it's a big, impressive, long river. Uh, is it the longest river in the world or is the Amazon River? I don't remember. One of those two for sure. I think it's the Nile, but I'm not sure. Anyways, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, he's saying, my river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Really, you made the Nile River? That's a bit boastful, don't you think? He's called the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, and by that he means crocodile. Uh, you're the crocodile swimming in the river. You think you're the biggest, baddest creature uh, in Egypt, and you're just not. Verse 4, but I will put my hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales, and I will bring thee up out of the midst of thy rivers, and all the fish of thy rivers shall stick unto thy scales, and I will leave thee thrown into the wilderness. Thee and all the fish of thy rivers, thou shalt fall upon the open fields, thou shalt not be brought together nor gathered. I have given thee for meat to the beasts of the field and to the fowls of the heaven. So he says, I will pull you out of the river by my hooks that I insert into your jaws. Uh, when you would catch an, a crocodile, I'm not going crocodile fishing, but uh, they would take hooks and stick them down into the water and catch them on the backside of the jaws of the crocodile and bring it up out of the water. And God said, you think you're this great dragon in this river that you claim to have created and that is yours? I'm going to stick my hooks in the water. I'm going to drag you right out of the river. Your fish or your people, they're going to cleave to your scales. I'm going to drag you on out of there, and I'm going to put you in the middle of the wilderness. Verse 5, and the fowls of the air in the open field are going to pick you apart and eat you. So if you go to Egypt, you'll see the pyramids. You've probably learned about them in school. Uh, I have actually seen them now. Pretty incredible sight for sure. Each pyramid was simply a tomb for a single pharaoh, if you can imagine that. And uh, so when you see those pyramids, that's one gravestone, if you will, one uh, marker in the cemetery for one person. And so their memorial and their legacy, their heritage was something that they prided themselves on. And God's telling this particular Pharaoh, forget the name of him all of a sudden, he's mentioned in 
uh, Jeremiah Hofa, perhaps, H-O-P-H-A. That's close, but I don't think that's right. Uh, he He's not going to have any marker. He's not going to have any legacy. There'll be no pyramid for this particular pharaoh. God's telling him, you know, you're so full of pride and you're so arrogant. I'm going to drag you out of the river, I'm going to, which means I'll take you out of your position of power. Your people that follow you are going to come with you out of that water. They're the fish clinging to the scales. I'm going to put you in the wilderness and then the predators, the beasts of the field, they're just going to desecrate your body and no one's going to remember anything about you. Pretty strong language here. Verse 6, And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they took hold of thee by thy hand, thou didst break and rend all their shoulder. And when they leaned upon thee, thou breakest and madest all their loins to be at a stand. So there are things we can lean on, right? You can lean on a railing. You can lean on a fence post. There's enough strength there to bear our weight. But imagine a reed, a small, thin weed growing up, a cattail perhaps, and uh, try to lean on that. What's going to happen? Well, it can't bear the weight. It's going to break. And so God says, when Israel tries to lean on you, you're going to break and you're not going to be able to support them. And they will then know that I am the Lord and I'm the one that they should be leaning on. Verse eight, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will bring a sword upon thee and cut off man and beast out of thee. And this sword that will come to Egypt is Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Because he hath said, the river is mine and I have made it. Boy, God's really taking personally this matter of the Pharaoh claiming that he made the Nile River, isn't he? Hey, God is a jealous God and he's jealous rightfully. He's jealous over that which uh, belongs and pertains to him. And by the way, jealousy is not sinful when we approach it in that manner ourselves. It's okay to be jealous uh, of something that you own and it belongs to you. Verse 9, and the land of Egypt shall be desolate. Well, we read that one. Verse 10, behold, therefore, I am against thee and against thy rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate, from the tower of Syene, even unto the border of Ethiopia. So he's giving the entire span of the nation here. Uh, it's just like when, when God says of Israel, from Dan unto Beersheba, it means the entire length of the land. And for Egypt, Syene unto the border of Ethiopia, that's the width of the land. No man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. And so God's saying that Egypt is going to suffer a forty-year desolation and uh, invasion where the people will be scattered. Yet thus saith the Lord God, verse 13, at the end of forty years, well, I gather the Egyptians from the people, whither they were scattered. Now, the Lord has made this promise to Israel before. Once I scatter you, I'm going to bring you back home. And now he's saying the same thing for the Egyptians. Isn't that interesting that God would show mercy to this people? And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation. And they shall be there a base kingdom. It shall exalt itself. Any, uh, I'm sorry. It shall be the basis of the kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them, that they shall be no more rule. That they shall no more rule over the nations. There was a time when Egypt was the powerhouse of the Middle East, and they were the nation to be feared and concerned with. And and God said, "I'm going to take that away from them." Think of it now. Uh, we have Egyptian friends. We're grateful for those Egyptian friends, but Egypt is not the powerhouse of the Middle East that it at one time was. Verse sixteen, and it shall no uh, be no more the confidence of the house of Israel. 
which bringeth their iniquity to remembrance when they shall look after them, but they shall know that I am the Lord God. And so Israel will no longer look to Egypt for confidence and strength and power. Verse 17, And it came to pass in the seven and twentieth year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Now we're back to Tyre, Tyrus again. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages, nor his army for Tyrus, for the excuse me, for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord. In that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to bud forth, and I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and invade Tyre and Sidon, and it says here that uh, verse 18 caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages nor his army for Tyrus for the service that he had served against it. God said, Nebuchadnezzar did my bidding and did my work in going into Tyrus, but there were no spoils to be received there. There was no reward for going there. So I will give him Egypt and the spoils of Egypt for his reward or recompense, if you will. You see how God uses Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon as a tool in his hand to judge these nations around him. That's why when Nebuchadnezzar, as we mentioned earlier in Daniel 3 and 4, says, uh, look at what I have built, God says, you didn't build anything, buddy. I did all of this. All it's going to take is for me to touch your brain and make you mentally unstable for seven years to show you that I am indeed the one behind all of this. All right, that's chapter number 29. Pretty simple and easy chapter. Three more chapters, 30, 31, 32, We'll all deal with Egypt as well. And then the book will shift once again in chapter 33. And as we head toward the ending of it, only 15 chapters left. That seems like a lot, but when you're dealing with 48 in total, it's pretty much the tail end of it all. All right. Thanks so much for watching. As always, please like, love, and share the post. Let people know that we're out here. And I'll see you tomorrow for chapter number 30. God bless you. Have a wonderful Tuesday.